So good afternoon, good morning for those of us on the West Coast. As my name is Randy Labonte uh, with the Canadian eLearning Network. It is my pleasure to do a quick introduction um, to Lise Pepperich, who is a uh, structural designer in ADLC, uh, Alberta Distance Learning Center. And uh, she is here to provide us with, I think, a topic <coughs> and some background uh, that I think is important for all of us who work online, and in particular uh, for those who are actually building some content for online learning. <coughs> uh, Lee's expertise uh, comes from a good uh, background as well, and Alberta Business Learning Center is one of the leaders, certainly in Alberta, for building the resources and uh, for online learning activities. So it's a real pleasure to have Lee's here to share some of her expertise with us. And uh, throughout the period, if you have questions, feel free to text. I'll do the the uh, interpretation and reading for at least so she can focus on what it is that she wants to talk about uh, with us. Uh, and if you do have a question at any point in time, uh, try just raising your hand, which is in the participant list area, just above your name, above Lisa's name, actually. Uh, and if you mouse over, you'll see there is an opportunity uh, to raise your hand and you can see there's a number one beside my name right now um, that I raised my hand. So you, you have a bit of a speaking order. So I'll at least give us an overview, but certainly want to encourage you to consider questions uh, and engage in the dialogue afterwards about your experiences in terms of building things online. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Lise to lead us through this uh, overview presentation and discussion. Please. Thanks, Randy. Um, I guess, yes, I've been with the Alberta Distance Learning Center for probably about 15 years now and in resource development for at least 10 of those years. And we've learned a lot of things. Um, just a little bit of history on ADLC. We've been around since, as you can see on the PowerPoint, 1923. But uh, more so in the online world, um, the first online courses started coming out in about, I think, 1996. And 98 was when ADLC jumped into that realm as well. And back then it was very much, uh, you know, uh, run and go. The teachers were just being ahead of the students. They were putting up content as quick as they could. And there was real no, no real structure or, or understanding of what it was to, to work in an online world. So, so I think over time we've come a really long way. And we built some pretty solid processes here at the Alberta Distance Learning Center. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about our processes and um, how we move uh, learning development forward. And more so specific on blueprinting, which is probably the most important thing that we do before we build any online course here at ADLC. So, so that will be the focus of this talk. And like Randy said, do feel free to uh, uh, put up questions. He said he'd flag me if there was a question because I'm not sure if I will notice them or not. Um, so if he flags me, I will definitely stop and answer any questions. And, and I hope you find this valuable. And I look forward to the conversation as well as we move through. I'm just going to shut off my video here to make sure that there is no um, hiccups in the, uh, in, the, in the presentation. So I'm just going to do that and then we'll get started. All right. All right. Like, um, like I said, over time we've really developed some strong processes, and the key here for us is to have an ultimate goal in mind. So no matter what we do at ADLC, no matter what we develop, what we do for kids, at the end of the day, we believe that that we want success for every student. So every choice we make, every item we put in a course or not put in a course is really based on this. Um, is this good for kids? Is it going to work for kids? Is it the best way to deliver this? If it is, then we do it. If we have questions about it, then we need to do a little more research and we really need to think that through. So, so whether this is your vision or what your school vision is or your own personal vision is around online teaching, you really need to have a goal. So, so for us, we set this. And to extend to this, when we ask our, our teachers to do bl blueprinting, we also ask them to think about five keywords. What are five key things that you would want your students to, to say about your courses? 
and you know they always throw out things like engaging or uh, you know that they're relevant or so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, what what's important about those five key words is that keep those in mind all the way through your development, so that whenever you come to to a decision that you need to make about one resource or another, or one way of delivery or another, or one piece of content or not, or how you're doing that then you can fall back on those keywords as well as your ultimate goal um, and make a decision. Is this, is this going to be relevant for students? Is this going to engage students? So, so having those five keywords as well as a, a main goal is, is really a great starting point for any project. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong arrows. I'm used to my keyboard arrows. All right. So we'll just jump a little bit into just an overview of our process. I'm not going to go into detail in all of these except for the blueprinting one, but just to give you a sense of the whole process. So, so in, well, in about the next month or so here, we always ask our departments and our teachers to, to have discussions in their departments about what kind of courses they need to, to enhance. And by enhancement, we mean you're either making some minor tweaks and changes to your courses or you're completely rewriting them because um, you're not liking the way that the flow is or there's some major issues with them. So, so in the spring, we always ask the departments to identify those and, and to make a list. Um, so that's just the proposal part, you know. Why, why do you need to redevelop these? What are your reasons? Um, what, what data, if any, that you've been able to pull that, that have helped you come to these conclusions and whatnot. So, so the wish list is always the starting part. And then once we've approved those, um, those development projects, then they move into the blueprinting phase, which I'll discuss in detail right away. Um, and once the blueprint is complete, then obviously we have the content writing phase, and then we have the production and design phase. So, so each of those phases are very important and they take time. And really at the end of the day, um, we have, uh, sorry, I was reading a, a question here, sorry. Um, at the end of the day, most of our projects take somewhere from, um, well, I'm going to say for a five credit course, about 10 months. About 10 months to develop a complete project for um, a five credit course, and that includes everything from the blueprint, the content writing, and the production online. All right, we'll just jump into our blueprinting. Now the blueprinting, like I said, is a pretty comprehensive um, activity. Uh, we always ask our teachers to, to not do this alone. Um, a triad is probably the best. Uh, if you can't find three people, then, then at least two. <laughs> But three is what we suggest, and triads just work best for all kinds of collaborative work. You always have, um, you know, two opinions and maybe someone to break that score, who knows. But at the end of the day, it just seems to be a really nice, uh, you know, composition for any team. So, so the teachers always never work in silos. They need to work in partnership with other teachers to build these so that um, if they become, you know, more rounded and not so so just one person's view on them. So having a team is really important. Now, uh, when we ask the, the teachers to do blueprinting, here are the seven, the seven steps that we, we, or seven steps, they are seven steps to success, but really they are the seven components of every blueprint. You know, we want them to have a rationale, we need them to, and I'll go through each of these um, in detail right away, but uh, prioritizing outcomes, thinking about initiatives, building assessment plans, student learning plans, resources, and then the last one, project management, isn't, you know, usually part of any lesson plan that you may have seen in the past, but, but it definitely comes into play here because uh, there are many people who are involved in a project, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. Uh, yes, Randy. Thanks. Yeah, no, I just uh, was curious if, <coughs> with the group that's in here. I know Cynthia from Bow Valley College as well, and I think Todd also from the Ontario eLearning Consortium. I'm wondering if, just as uh, my way of polling, if anyone either follows a similar sort of process in developing content or if this is something that's internalized. Because I know 
please, I, I have the opportunity to look ahead in terms of where you're going. So I think there's a lot of tips and skills and uh, resources that will be helpful for anyone developing content, but this more structured process that AVLC follows, uh, if others do. Uh, Todd, do you want to just chime in maybe for a second? And uh, Cynthia, if you're there, maybe you can talk a little touch on what Bow Valley College does in the post-secondary environment. Sure, Andy. Uh, thank you. Uh, so when ELO does, uh, ELO being e-learning Ontario, uh, which is a branch of the ministry that's responsible for governing and organizing e-learning in Ontario amongst its 63-64 uh, school boards, they uh, have a process that they follow or did when they were in the curriculum writing, um, I guess, business, a process that they follow for everything from a uh, project proposal to a call for writers to the, the writing process itself, not overly dissimilar from uh, Alberta Systems uh, Learning Center, and then their quality assurance program. However, they've uh, since gotten out of that business and are now outsourcing that to board. Uh, with that, however, comes some support, but they don't try to dictate the uh, the writing process that boards are following. However, they do uh, still require that boards follow their quality assurance tool, which is rather uh, detailed and comprehensive, and uh, it, it somewhat does have an influence upon the uh, the writing process that various teams throughout the province uh, undertake. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. I don't know, Lee's whether you have any comments, and uh, so I'm texting as well. Lee's, don't worry about the text. I'll bring it to your attention, but I'm engaging conversation uh, besides uh, your presentation as we as we go along. And Clinton, yeah, I know you do you private school in Calgary, and there's this I think conversation. And for those that are watching the recording uh, as well, if you are, um, this is a dialogue that I think the Canadian e-learning network wants to be involved in and also to support uh, your work as in terms of steering towards resources. So we're planning a follow-up uh, with this after this presentation with uh, more resources and about this conversation because it's one that carries forward. This is just not a one of. It's something which we all need to engage in on a regular basis. I know that ADLC has done that internally and does have some expertise uh, to share and I think this is just the start of the dialogue. So. Thanks, folks. Anybody else with a comment before we turn it back to Lee? Sorry for interrupting you. Okay. Thanks, folks. Just text away. So, Lee, sorry. Back to you. Okay. Yeah, no worries. No, feel free to bring up and, uh, and I'll try to ignore the texting so that I can just do the presentation here, but I appreciate you taking care of those questions. And, yes, feel free to share your your um, what you're doing in your organizations and um, things that are similar to this or different because you know we are all here to learn and I would I would love to hear about those those items as well. So basically here are the seven steps and we'll just run through them. Now um, really at the end of the day you need to have a set of standards that you want your your teachers or that your organization needs or your school needs to to write towards and finding those set of standards that work for you is really uh, an institutional decision that you need to make. And here at ADLC, we've chosen Quality Matters, um, likely because it seemed to address most of our needs. Um, it identified some really key standards that we felt were important and that we could build upon. So, so really for us, it's just a tool that we use to first evaluate our, our courses, um, or we also use it if we're enhancing or developing new courses from, from nothing. Then we use it as, as kind of those building blocks or a roadmap, you know, to building a successful online course. So having a set of standards that you, you have at the base of anything you do is really important. What those are, like Randy mentioned, um, he will have some other resources from eCampus on, uh, on this topic as well. I'm more than willing to share, you know, some of our standards and processes. I have, you know, various documents, checklists, whatnot that might be useful as well that I, I'll provide to Randy. But really at the end of the day when I ask teachers to give me a rationale about why 
you know, why you need to redevelop or enhance this course, what you want to do in this course, who's your audience, who are you targeting, and those kinds of things. I really re I ask them to use Quality Matters rubrics language in order to help identify those, as well as using other data pieces that they gather by, you know, what, what are our completion rates, what success are students having on certain assignments or certain parts, certain units, that kind of thing. So, so they can take you know, that data plus use the rubrics in order to build this rationale on what are you doing exactly, why are you doing it, and who you're doing it for. So, so really that's the first piece of your blueprint is to identify that rationale. And this is a good place too to include your, your five um, keywords that you want students to say about your course when you're done. So, so this is where that would fit in as well. So once the rationale is done, the next step is likely the most important step that um, we have teachers do here in this blueprinting process, and that's prioritizing outcomes. Um, of the Alberta government, like some other governments, other gov governments in general, usually have pretty heavy um, curriculums that, that we need to deal with. And Doing this step really helps teachers dive into that curriculum, understand what's there, and prioritize those outcomes. Um, what are the big ideas? What are your endearing outcomes? What are the must-haves in your course that you must teach to that students must have understanding about? And then, you know, what, what are the important outcomes that, you know, deal with knowledge and skill and whatnot? as well as the good to know. So, so we really have a three tier there that we have teachers work together and again a triad works best to prioritize their outcomes in order to have this understanding of their curriculum and then everything else comes much easier, whether it's, you know, building assessments or the learning path and everything else that I'll talk about. So once you have those outcomes prioritized in those three categories, then then you can really see how they fit together um, and and what those units of learning will look like because you you have your endearing supported by your important and your good to know and you're ready to go. You've clustered those and you're ready to build your units. And again, at the bottom I always um, state, you know, QM, that's, that's quality matters and those are some of the pages or some of the standards that you might refer to if, if you were you know, doing this here with us and using our standards. So really that, that's the first step and this takes weeks. Um, usually teachers will sit together for a few weeks on this and, and try to prioritize their outcomes and go back and forth and, and, and build this part of the blueprint. Once they have their outcomes, um, here again, I mean you're, you're looking at, I see the year olds were added, thank you Randy. But uh, these are just quick links. Uh, another piece that we really ask teachers to think about are initiatives. Now we have initiatives that come from Alberta Education and I've listed the, the main ones here, the Inspiring Ed, Fundamental Principles gui um, Guiding High School Redesign, as well as the Learning and Technology Policy Framework. I mean these are three initiatives that are, that are big right now at Alberta Education. Um, and so we need to consider those. Uh, we need to incorporate those in everything that we do. So you need to have an understanding around these initiatives. And at PHRD, at Pemmenah Hills School, School uh, Pemmenah Hills Regional Division here, we um, we also talk a lot about universal design for learning. So that's another initiative that that they need uh, to be aware of and understand, have some understanding around. As well as you know, here at the Alberta Distance Learning, we often talk about community of inquiry framework. So what is teacher present? What does that look like in your course? How, how do we include cognitive presence and social presence? So again, there's, there's links to these different initiatives and, and really initiatives are, are what your school division or your um, universities or colleges or whatnot, what, what kinds of initiatives or what's guiding you um, down that path. So being aware of those initiatives and understanding, having understandings around them, discussions around them, and then including them in, in the work that you do moving forward is really important. So identifying those, having understandings, and then incorporating them into your design. 
And once you've done all that, <laughs> then the next thing to do is start with the end in mind. Um, we really push strongly here that once you know what your outcomes are, once you know uh, what your initiatives are, what kind of uh, you know, environment you're building for, what, and for us it's Moodle at the moment. So we're building in Moodle, you know, what does that mean? What are the tools there? So having all of those understandings, now, now you're ready to build your assessment plan. And, and again, you know, we refer to quality matters. Uh, we refer to universal design for learning, multiple means of actions and expressions. So, so really it's about building all of those pieces, that assessment plan, that meet all of those outcomes. So what were your enduring, your most important, and your, you know, nice to knows, and ensuring that the right level of assessment is tied to each of them. And not, uh, you know, when I look at these plans when they come in and I see that, you know, they've used multiple choice questioning for almost everything, then I have to question that they haven't really put much thought into their assessment plan. And I'm not saying multiple choice questioning is, is not um, an efficient way or an accurate way to measure um, student learning, but it definitely shouldn't be the only way that you're using. Uh, there are so many more ways to gather evidence around what students are doing, whether you're doing that through, you know, verbal communication, um, or through formative assessments, or through self-assessments, self-reflections, peer assessments. I mean, there's a whole big picture there all around assessment, and I'm not going to um, sit here and, and, well, I won't go into deep detail around assessment, but I'm sure you're all aware. <laughs> but this is a really important piece, and it needs to be solid before you can move forward on anything else. So you have your, your outcomes, you have your assessment plan, and then you can move forward on your student learning plan. And here again, you know, we have the quality matters standards that it refers to. We think of multiple means of representation. Um, this is really the path the student will take. You know what your outcomes are. You know how they're going to show, show you evidence of learning. How, now what are they going to learn in between? Um, how are you going to get them from from that from one point to the next point? So this is really your learning path. These are all the activities, the practice, um, you know, the different ways that you show them content, whether it be video, text, graphics, images, whatever you want to use um, in order to to deliver that that content and to to have the students give the students many opportunities for practice and to provide any kind of scaffold that you feel they might need. So, so all of that is built into your student learning path, which is the next piece that you would put together for your, um, for your plan here. Now the next, the next piece here is, is your resources. So once you have most of your planning put in place, it's important that you now start to think about your resources. You may have already started a resource list as you were going along, absolutely, but this is when you solidify it. Um, you really need to, to think about engagement, obviously. Uh, you need to make sure that there's proper alignment. Um, the video might be really cool and interesting, but does it align to, to the learning that you want the students to do? Is it going to give them what they need in order to to gain the knowledge that you're hoping and the understanding that you're hoping that they will have. So, so really the resource choices are, are very important and should be done in a methodical kind of way. Um, are they copyright free? I mean, this is something we deal with a lot and when I go to various presentations across, um, you know, across the province um, and I listen to teachers talk about how they're building their online courses. This little piece here always makes me cringe because um, I hear things like, oh, well, you know, I just left up questions here I found on X and X and whatever, whatever, and, and I, just, I just worry that, that they're not considering copyright. And, and the thing is, is that when we're building an online course, um, it's, it's online, it, it's public, and, 
and it needs to be copyright free. And if you're using copyrighted items, then you need to have the right copyright licenses to go with them, obviously. So, so this is a piece that we spend a lot of time on. Um, the teachers here are very good at it now. They don't, uh, they question everything actually now, which is good. I would rather they question everything than just assume that they might be able to use something. So having a copyright process in place is really important. Um, here, all we do is, is we have a copyright officer, and so we put in all of our requests to them um, at the beginning of a project and say, you know, we want to use this piece or this video or this piece off of this uh, text, or can we use this poem in this textbook, and so on and so forth. And they have a list of resources that they want to use, and then we go through and we acquire copyright for all of them. Um, and the ones that we can't, then we have to reassess and find something else. But but having some kind of copyright process or some kind of monitoring on copyright is really important. Um, and and really, I mean, when you're picking resources, like I said, engagement is important. And you just need to make sure that you're providing the different kinds of um, different kinds of resources. Yes, Randy. Just uh, Jeff, a text to the question there about whether fair dealing conversations have taken place as part of that process with you. Fair dealings, as in uh, items that we can use with fair use. Is maybe that Jeff, just grab. I'm not sure. Jeff, grab the mic and maybe clarify your question. I got it here. I think um, just uh, conversations recently about trying to figure out where fair dealings makes you makes. Uh, comes into effect. Obviously, the fair use laws in the United States have now slid over to Canada. There's a, a brand new copyright law that uh, is now governing us, and and uh, you know the whole fair dealings piece um, is uh, is becoming quite a conversation. I just wondered, you know, where that enters in, because uh, depending on how you read that bill or that conversation, go through that conversation, it talks about the possibility that most things, if used in education and if behind a uh, password protected place like an LMS would be um, gives pretty much open use of, of a large number of, of uh, what were formerly uh, situations and, and, and uh, materials that were covered by copyright. I just wondered if, if that conversation's really been, been carried any kind of fruition because I'm still confused by it obviously as to where it takes us to. Well I can say here at ADLC we use a 10 percent rule for that, that piece of the copyright. Um, if you're using less than 10% of something, then you can use it without um, acquiring copyright for it. So that's the rule that we use here, and that's probably very, um, very strict. I do know that the, the, the rules have loosened up quite a bit, but I guess we just haven't uh, ventured further than that at this point, but I'd love to hear if others know, know more than I do, but we do use the 10% rule in most everything that we, we put together. Yeah, I think just uh, I'll jump in and comment on that is that uh, the, the cold copyright world is um, Problematic at best and not easy to navigate, certainly for uh, K to 12 teachers, nor instructors in post secondary. So, some organizational guidance is really important, so you can certainly push that forward. Uh, it's also, I think, why open education resources are ones that are looked to. Um, understanding Creative Commons licensing is a little simpler for educators. Uh, and something which uh, is is appropriate. The problem, I think, and we've had this discussion about ABLC, when you triage and break down content or courses that you have, uh, there's uh, copyright licenses which need to be um, uh, uh, considered, and a lot of teachers uh, don't see that or understand that, the level of technical there, and that's really where an organizational approach to this whole copyright laws is really, really important. And uh, Difficult and problematic. So um, you can do some searching for Creative Commons open license materials is sometimes the simplest solution for educators as they move forward. Absolutely. And we do have um, teachers who do, do look for OER type materials and uh, and go there first. But but some things are, are some things. 
you want to do a film study in the English course, well, you're going to need to, to have certain films and certain clips of films and whatnot in order to support your lessons and, and you are likely not finding that without any copyright attached to it. So, so really it, it's what you're looking for. We always, um, you know, for images and whatnot, we, we do license a, um, a site called iStock that we grab all of our images from. If we need something different, then we have a couple of graphic designers that will draw us images. If we find images on other sites, then we will purchase those. So, or we will take our own. So at the end of the day, images for us it, is not a big deal. I think it comes down to content pieces, um, books you want to use, or pieces of books you want to use, or um, you know, films and whatnot. That's where we really find we, we just can't get away from using copyright because um, you know, it is what it is unless you're using, you know, books that are no longer in print and that have been put on, I can't even remember what that list is called that you don't need copyright for, but um, those are pretty old. So at the end of the day, if you want anything recent and whatnot, you're usually looking at, at some copyright. So I think it's really great to try to move towards more OER in your courses, absolutely. Is it is it possible 100%? We haven't found a way yet. Um, it's really hard to, to not have to have some copyright items in your courses, but if you can avoid it, uh, then please do. I mean, that's, that's the simplest way to, to develop an online course is to have it copyright free. And then you can pass it around from one organization to the other. I know that we have um, the Moodle hub here in Alberta and I think there's people from BC as well involved in that and, and they share content back and forth but the sharing of content may break some copyright rules if you have any copyright in your courses. So, so if you're building content you want to share out to other people and just give away then, then you need to really ensure that they are copyright free and, and that's not always easily done. Not always easily done. Why not adapt? Oh. I will let the conversation go. I don't know if that was a question for me or not, but um, sure. I mean, adapt conventional text. I think is is there. And Paul, uh, I just would when you posed that question, I texted the the rationalization around OER is sometimes problematic and difficult, um, and that's why in the post secondary world, BC campus went down building open textbooks. So they got gathered together uh, key uh, educators and designers and put them together in, in think tanks or sort of <laughs> I almost called sweatshops where they pulled them together for a week where they just pushed hard to build an open textbook and license it. The problem and they, that is sort of an adaptation of conventional text for online. Uh, but that takes a lot of resourcing and support, and uh, that only comes about in organizations like BC Campus. Uh, eCampus Alberta is doing OER, but is not actually developing necessarily. And that's what ADLC is trying to do as well in some of their resources, that they're building uh, resources that are available that it can be shared uh, within, and you're mentioning the Moodle Hub is, is one of those. Uh, the problem is, is you're only as good as your source to ensure that actually there is no copyright abrogation that's going on. So that does take some collective uh, knowledge and wisdom there. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, all right. Uh, project management. Like I said, uh, this doesn't really fall into your regular teacher plan or how you're going to build out your units and, and your unit plans and whatnot, which is what in a nutshell, blueprinting is, it's all about building a really strong plan for your course, having a really strong direction as to where you want to go. Uh, but in order to do that, you need a lot of people to be involved. Um, some teachers do do it alone and do everything by themselves and they are phenomenal at technology and everything else. Um, but my experience, or at least here at the Alberta Distance Learning Center, we have a wide range of skills with our teachers. We have fabulous teachers who, who really understand pedagogy, 
but aren't all that comfortable building in an online environment or um, don't have those technical skills up to where they, they need to be in order to be successful here. So, so they might feel very confident in writing their content, but building a video, no, not going to happen. They need support. Um, and so that's where project management really comes in and is key because there are so many moving parts to any given project that we do that, that we try to help our teachers understand the basics of project management. Um, we provide them some checklists and supports and whatnot in order to better understand this piece, but it's really important. Uh, no project goes well without a timeline, without understanding what are your deliverables and when those fit into the big scheme of things. Uh, if you have writers, peer reviewers, editors, when are all they, when, when do each of them touch the content and when is it back so that you can continue what you need to do with it and when is it ready for your design staff to take it and when should you start building those videos and when should you build that interactive you really want and, 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 and. So, at the end of the day, project management is really important. Um, you know, we just have teachers build out maps. Uh, you know, none of them are versed in Gantt ch charts, but if you, you are familiar with those and you're comfortable in those, then obviously that's what you would use. But most of our teachers just, just do a brainstorm of what are all the deliverables and let's put some dates to it and let's figure out who's going to do what when and when we, we can start what where. So. And um, yeah, so I mean, it just it just becomes an integral part, even though it is completely different than what you would have to do in a classroom. Um, you definitely wouldn't have all those moving parts in a classroom, but when you're building an online course, you do. So having some project management skills is really important, and defining those roles and responsibilities. Um, we've had lots of issues along the way where um, a designer and a, a teacher may, may have differing opinions and who's right and who's wrong and at the end of the day here we, we try to divide that anything, any pedagogical decision that is made needs to come from our teachers and any design decision that is made based on our standards and branding and whatnot can come from our designers. So, so having a clear cut set of roles of, and responsibilities for everyone involved really does um, does help a project move forward. And something else that I, another issue when I think of project management here is communication. Um, I, I can't stress enough that as a team you need to meet weekly to talk about the project, how it's moving forward and any issues that are coming up and clear those up as they go along. Um, you can't be hands off. If you're building a project here or any kind of course here with, with a team, then you have to be completely hands-on. And it's not about micromanaging, but it is about managing. So, so keeping all of the parts moving and all of the parts oiled so that nobody's squeaking and that everybody has what they need to be able to move themselves forward, then, then that just makes for a more successful, so, but more successful project. So key here really is communication and, and uh, you know, I stress that a lot with our teachers around, you know, how to manage your project and how to communicate with your team and how to get everyone on the same page. So the first thing they do is an initial meeting and they talk about the blueprint. They share the blueprint with everybody in their group and they go through all of the pieces of the blueprint and they, um, they lay out the timeline, they lay out the deliverables everyone's responsible for. And, you know, they lay out the, the vision and the understanding so that everyone is on the same page and everyone can move forward down the same direction and not be fighting against each other to, to go down a different road when you should all be going down the same road. So project management is, is really key here to, to any successful project or any successful course development if you're building as a team and that's what we do here. All right, I can't stress enough about standards. Um, again, you, you need to set your own standards with your division, with your college, with your university, what, wherever you are at. 
Uh, like I said, we use Quality Matters. That's around best practices in blended and online learning. Um, we've also written a writer's guide. We've written a writer's guide for the web, an editorial guide. These guides provide guidance for our editors and for our writers um, so that we are all meeting the same standards when we build any of our courses. Um, so any kind of standards that you, you put together are important. Um, you know, they need to start somewhere. We started these last year. We're just continuously working on them. They're living documents. Um, they're tweaked and changed all the time. But at the end of the day, we, we all need to start from the same place. And so this gives us at least a starting point so that we can assure that every course that we deliver here can be of the same standard. And that was really a struggle for us for many years because, um, you know, you look at, at how we used to develop online courses and it really was the Wild West. And it was do it as fast as you can and get it up there for students. And there was really no consideration around standards, around what is a good online course, what should I include in my course, how should I deliver it, what's the best way to, to present this for students, and, and then how do I teach in this environment. So, so all of that, you know, we used to, to leave just for everyone to decipher and figure out on their own. So, so here we've really been trying to pull that in and trying to get everyone to have a, a basic understanding of best practices and, you know, some basic standards around, you know, how you write and how you put things up and, and whatnot just so that we can help them, you know, build better courses. And another thing we've done which has been really kind of fun is, is building some templates in Moodle. Um, Moodle is a free LMS, well it's not really free, it's just free to put on your servers, but you actually have to buy a server to put it on and then you have to hire someone to help you manage your server. So at the end of the day, Moodle is not free, but Moodle is a great environment that we can modify with the help of our um, Moodle support team um, to do just about anything we wanted to do. So I guess that's the exciting point part about Moodle is that it is very flexible in that way. So what we've done is we built um, 16, actually, 16 templates with different looks and feels and we built a, our own modified editor that, that teachers can go in and, uh, and actually use the editor to build courses. So basically I, I kind of look at it as if you can build a PowerPoint, you can build a course in Moodle with us because we've, we've really modified the environment and made it really friendly and really easy to use. And that was key because um, we're about continuous improvement here. We want our teachers to be able to go in and continuously improve their courses. And if technology or not knowing how to use certain tools or certain technologies to be able to do that is is a roadblock, then we needed to remove that roadblock. So, so by building our templates and style guides, we, we ensure standards and we also have facilitated um, teachers in being able to build their own courses in that environment. So um, not today, but another time, I'd be more than willing to show you some, some templates or maybe I can throw up a few of the templates in uh, the documentation that that I provide Randy and you can have a look at what I mean by building online templates in Moodle. Um, it was costly, um, you know, about a hundred thousand if you want a number to build these templates, but I think in the end it will save us a lot of money because we won't have to hire so many people to help us build courses and, and uh, teachers can feel like they can handle that piece on their own, which will be really good. And the last uh, piece here on conformance testing. What we've noticed over time is that uh, what schools need and what schools use, what students use, um, affects everything that we do here. So last year we had uh, one of our staff members do a research project and we went out and we, we uh, talked to a lot of schools and we surveyed schools and we we gather that data to have a better understanding of um, what are the main devices that students are using currently, but where is the trend moving towards and what might we be using down the way. And then we've also uh, 
you know, make sure that we we have a large variety of devices at our fingertips. And so whenever teachers say, oh, I really want to use this cool whatever in my course, it actually goes through a conformance testing um, kind of shoot. And we tested in, in multiple browsers on multiple devices just to ensure that uh, that it works everywhere. And if it doesn't work everywhere, then we can at least let teachers know that and say, okay, well, if you choose to use this, um, your course will only work here or here. And seeing as Chromebooks have uh, multiplied like rabbits lately in all the school divisions, likely because of cost and definitely not because of functionality, but likely because of cost, um, we need to, to address that. So there's a lot of things that we have in our courses like Flash, like uh, um, fillable PDF, um, and a few other items that, that just don't function well on Chromebooks. And so we're looking at, you know, what can we do with those? So then you start, you know, going down the road of, of uh, modifying all of these items to make them more conform it to, to the devices that are being used out there. So I think just having an understanding of what your students are using, what you need to build for, um, really helps you narrow the field as to what maybe kind of moving parts you can actually include in your courses. So, so that conformance piece is definitely new for us and it has uh, changed the way we do things and look at things and what we say yes to. It's not just a blanket, oh sure, give that a try. Um, the way that it used to be because that does uh, not always work everywhere. Right. Um, the last couple pages are just links to all kinds of uh, different things that, uh, that I talked about when I talked about initiatives or whatnot, so you're more than welcome to, to look at any of those if you're interested. Um, otherwise, that's, that's blueprinting in a nutshell. and. Uh, and like I said, we, we were only starting down this road. We started blueprinting in this way about uh, two years ago. And uh, every year we tweak it and, and we make it better. But, uh, but teachers' comments back have been very positive. They all love the experience of building their blueprint. They feel that it really gives them a really good understanding of what they're going to do next when they build their course, what it's going to look like, um, what kinds of things they're going to include, and and it just gives them that that overview that they weren't perhaps getting before because it was just you know let's quickly plan these out and get them up. But um, I think they they appreciate. Uh, the process. I haven't heard anyone who has said to me, I really hate blueprinting, though it's not easy. It's probably the hardest thing that you would have to do. Um, most people are quite receptive and they're they're willing to dive in and to give it a try and it's been, um, at the end, it's just been producing better courses than we've had before. So it's, it's been a positive change for us. Um, I'm not sure if there's uh, any questions or any discussion that you want to have, but that's that's blueprinting in a nutshell. Fantastic. I really do appreciate that and uh, do want to say um, thanks and looking forward. I think some of the commentary in here is good. Um, it starts the conversation, but I think there's a lot of follow-up. So leave anything that ADSC is willing and able to share back into the network I think is really, really important. We would love to do that. So uh, as indicated, I will uh, be compiling this and I'll send around an email with this information widely and feel free to share beyond. I think as part of the cannular network, it's important that we gather some resources together that are useful for everyone and share. That's really what the network was based on and uh, was developed for. So Lise, thank you for sharing from ADLC and thank you for sharing your own personal uh, professional experiences and learning journey, and thank you for those who have attended here. Um, any parting questions other than waiting for us to consolidate some more information and, and share that back for folks? Great. So at this point in time, I'll kick up the recording. Feel free to stick around if you have additional questions, but Lisa, on behalf of the network, thank you so much. Uh, lots to think about and lots that we'll follow up with. So thank you very much.